Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Hi everyone. I'll just wait a little bit longer for some more people to come in from the waiting room. I know there's sometimes a bit of a delay. Thanks so much for joining everyone. I'll wait uh, a couple more seconds <clears throat> and I'll get going. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you very much for connecting everyone. And I believe we will get started. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Glad you could all make it. Um, I'm Alexia Croft, Senior Project Director here in the Sustainable Business team at Reuters Events. And welcome to this webinar on the promise of electrification. This is the first webinar in our new series that we're hosting in collaboration with IEEE Technology Center for Climate on empowering the green tech revolution. And uh, to, to share some more information about this work, I'd like to welcome Clara from their team to, um, to explain. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Alexia. Um, a warm welcome also from uh, on behalf of IEEE. My name is Clara Nettel. I'm the head of the IEEE Technology Center for Climate. Um, IEEE is the world's largest technical association and well, electricity is in our name. Uh, we have a lot of uh, resources relating to climate from um, scientific publications, conferences, standards. But as we all know here, uh, climate-related matters are complex and multidisciplinary, so collaboration is important, and uh, this is also the aim of our, our uh, center, so to support collaboration and partnerships. And this is, uh, well, we're excited about this collaboration with uh, Reuters, where we are going to um, explore different aspects on technology and climate, and we are going to start with uh, the electrification one, we are going to continue with the impact of uh, frontier technologies, more on that at the end of the webinar. I hope you enjoy this. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks so much, Clara. Um, and thank you for that. So um, today we've got an incredible conversation, as Clara mentioned, which I'm really looking forward to. We're very lucky to have this opportunity to share such a comp comprehensive discussion with some of the best ex experts in their field. Um, led by Ursula Woodburn, director of CISL Europe. But before I hand over just a bit of housekeeping from me, we're looking to make this discussion as interactive as possible. So it, it, please ask any questions to our panelists in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen that you'd want to ask. We'll do a, a, our best to keep a track of them as we go, and we'll um, have a dedicated uh, Q&A period at the end of the webinar. So get your questions in. Um, don't forget to mention your name and an organization. And uh, I'll leave it there. So enough from me. Over to you, Ursula. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alexia. And uh, I'm delighted to be here today and to this webinar, which is about such a critical issue, the promise of electrification empowering the green technology re revolution from design to deployment. So quickly, just to introduce myself. So as, as Alexia said, I, I'm uh, I work for the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, but I lead their, their European office and specifically I work with uh, companies in the Corporate Leaders Group Europe, which brings together leading companies aiming to support the transition to climate neutrality. And as such, I've worked across a number of energy and climate fields for, for several years, as mainly on EU policy. Um, but I'm very pleased to have such a distinguished panel of guests and experts today, bringing both global technical expertise but also the perspective of businesses, both from those who are producing electricity and scaling it up, and those who are also using it in different um, applications, both to uh, reduce or decarbonize their operations, but also to, to look at their, their broader supply chains. So first of all, um, just a few points as to why this is so important at the moment. I think we all saw the, the global stock take that came out um, at the end of uh, last week, 
Um, this is the synthesis report that the that has been done ahead of the, the UNFCCC's global stock take process. And what did it tell us? It told us that we are not on track to reach the Paris Agreement goals. Current, uh, current, currently, we will go over 1.5 with all the devastation that will bring globally. But what it also says is what this means is we need to accelerate action. We need to scale up renewable energy. We need to phase out non-abated uh, non fossil fuels. And electrification will be critical in this process to decarbonize our operations and on green technology more globally. Of course, it's not by itself. And of course, there are many challenges in terms of how we can scale this up. So I hope that in this webinar today, we can address both the promise, but also what are the challenges we need to, ta to, to tackle in order to scale up this really critical technology. I also talked about the intensive efforts that we need to, we need to collaborate globally on this technologies, on the clean technologies, if we are to reach our Paris Agreement goals. So more than ever, this is a critical topic. Um, we also know from the IEA that uh, the share of electricity in uh, the energy system or energy demand will need to increase by 4% each year if we are to stay on track for their net zero by 2050 scenario. Across, across the uh, across the, the 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 issues we are seeing, it is just incredibly critical now to to work on this issue. But with no more ado, I'd like to introduce the panel. Um, if uh, if they could uh, introduce themselves and provide just a few words on on why they are, are working on this issue, I'd like to start start with uh, uh, Professor Cipher Ryman from uh, IEEE. He's the founding director of the Advanced Research Institute of Virginia Tech. Uh, USA, and he also directs the Center for Energy and the and uh, the Global Environment. And he is currently uh, the 2023 IEEE uh, President and CEO. Uh, Saifa, if you'd like to, to talk a bit about your perspective. Thank you, Ursula, very much for the kind introduction. First of all, we are talking about electrification. And electrification is a part of the solution, not the whole solution, because you cannot just electrify without figuring out where the power is coming from. If you electrify your, your, your town with the electricity from a coal plant, it doesn't help. So this is the challenge we have to be careful. Where is the power coming from? Second is very quickly, we at IEEE, as a group of technologists, are promoting clean tech solutions for climate sustainability. Clean tech could be many things, nuclear included, nuclear, solar, hydro, biomass. So I want to keep the option open that is we are all inclusive and do our part as we go forward thank you thank you so much um moving on um i'd like to bring in uh francisco lavron simavia who is the ibidrola uh, direction of energy policies um uh, head of the energy policy in ibidrola he's had a long career in ibidrola working across uh, both energy policy and regulation, and it has a background in industrial engineering. Now, Bedrola is, of course, one of the, the world's largest electricity companies in terms of stock market capitalization. So this is a, a key area of interest to you, I imagine, Francisco, if you'd like to introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Ursula. Yes, so I work for uh, Iberdrola. We are a Spanish uh, electricity utility. We <clears throat> we are probably the first large utility that started to invest heavily on renewables, and and things have gone well since more than 20 years ago. So we think that, um, I mean, because climate change, pollution, and, and other issues, I mean, to change from an unsustainable energy system based on fossil fuels to a sustainable system based on renewables is a must for many things, for environmental reasons, but also for economic reasons. We can, we can talk uh, later about, about this. So we see clearly that the electricity sector in the future is going to base to be based on, on renewables. And it's, it's not just about cleaning the electricity system, but cleaning about uh, uh, all the energy sector. So how to clean the energy sector? So the first uh, lever to do that is to electrify uh, current uh, fossil fu fuel uses through electric vehicles, through heat pumps, through other ways of doing that. So we think that from the more or less 20% of final energy consumption being electricity today, 
uh, in a future where uh, we have a, com a carbon neutral uh, energy system, system this 20% it could go up to, I don't know, 70%, something like that. So this is the first uh, lever and we think it's really important. We can talk later about opportunities and why this is this, this is it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francisco. And and finally to uh, to Katerina Tomov, who's the, the Global Senior Vice President of Environment, Social and, and Governance at uh, Deutsche Post DHL Supply Chain Division. Um, she started her work life uh, with Sensor and Sensor and Electronics Pioneer SIG AG, but has had a number of management positions at Deutsche Post. Um, but since March 2023, she is shaping the sustainability agenda for them and reporting to the CEO. But um, so it'd be great to hear from your perspective, Katerina, as to how DHL sees this in, in their operations. Yeah, thank you very much, Ursula. So um, as you said, I've held several positions also in the ESG area or the sustainability area. And um, hence, I can also see a little bit the development. I'd like to elaborate in the discussion a bit on that. But maybe first about overall um, DHL group. I mean, we have a set ourselves the aspiration to be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, and that is seems a long time ago, but or still a long time. Uh, time away, but um, we also set ourselves more closer target by 2030 in line with the science-based target initiative. Um, so we would reduce around 10 million tons of CO2. And as you can imagine, what we do is transport and warehousing. So um, the road is a diff is one of the ways. Obviously, um, aviation and ocean are also key, key parts of transport. But if we focus on the road bit, we also have the target to electrify 60% of our last mile delivery vehicles by 2030. So that would be more than 50%. Um, and the same, also there's an electricity need on top of that for our buildings, because we want to have every building that we bought, what, that we built needs to be carbon neutral. And that means it's basically, I mean, we never have true zero, zero, but it really means we install something that uh, all the technology um, goes to bring brings the energy consumption so far down and then replaces by electricity so heat pumps and the like which also will increase the energy demand and both the road electrification but also the warehousing we do only makes sense if we have the respective grid so we're heavily reliant on energy supply um, and electrification being one of the chosen technologies for going to zero or road freight decarbonization um, will definitely increase the demand. And with having so many vehicles as we have, plus our subcontractors, it's almost impossible to solve that, that alone. And that's why I'm happy we're together now. I, I don't think we can solve the whole thing in one hour, but at least if we can contribute to taking a step further and making visible what we would need and what we could actually do, I'd be very happy. And also, of course, looking forward to any questions that the audience will have throughout the, this course. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Katerina. And, and just a quick note, we're very sorry to announce as well that, that Tom House is unable to join us today due to a family emergency, but uh, hopefully I can bring in some of the European policy perspective as we go through uh, this conversation. So I think at this point, perhaps this is the moment where we talk about a little bit what the challenges are and what the bottlenecks and therefore what we can do to 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 um, to move forward. Um, Professor Rahman, um, what do you think um, we really have to put in place? Um, what do we have to be aware of when we think about electrification? And um, I mean, I thought it was interesting, Katerina brought up the grids. I mean, this does seem to be one of the, the key bottlenecks, does it not? Yes, I mean, it's one, to be honest. <laughs> Maybe we can start a bit with the challenges and then come to the solution. So um, if you look at our current fleet and just start not even including our subcontractors and other partners, um, of course, if we want to switch to electric, that is an enormous additional um, need for for electricity and also reliable charging. So 
Um, we've recently introduced wherever we could electric trucks and vehicles. Um, and we have to say in some of the countries, they're not running stable just simply because um, we don't have the electricity available um, steadily and, and solidly. That's one. If we stay with the infrastructure already to get the different way of uh, electricity that you needed, you cannot just plug it into your switch, right? We know all that. So in order to get the municipality and everyone who needs to be there to get you the connection to the grid, that also takes some time. And sometimes they might not have enough, so then they will say no. So there's a if we start at our depot where we want to connect, that's one. Um, that has we've had cases where this took a loan, I would say more than a year, one and a half years for a single um, site and its connectivity. But then in the infrastructure in terms of charging stations, if we look at um, heavy duty vehicles, we hardly have any at the moment in the EU. So um, even if we had the trucks, which is another restriction that we can't get enough trucks from the manufacturers, even if we had the trucks, we wouldn't know where to charge them. Indeed. So um, it's a little bit like, I mean, everyone who's on the call can, can think about if you were offered an electric car and then you ask, but okay, where could I charge it? And the answer is nowhere, but at home then how attractive is that and how feasible is it actually to run that? So I think we really got, I'm, I'm just starting with with a view of, of the challenge that I think we really need to solve because, yeah, I, I get people asking me, well, but why do you not have more? And I say, well, first, we don't get more from the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And second, um, we have nowhere to charge them at the moment. I think there Indeed. are below 10 charging stations that I'm aware of, and mm -hmm. there are zero mega charging stations that we can use for the trucks, which really need a different um, amount and amount capacity. There. Of course, yeah. Uh, um, Saifu, what's your, what is your perspective on this? I think Katarina has pointed to the big infrastructure challenges. Um, Perhaps this is, I guess you maybe subscribe to this, but are there other things you'd also like to, to, to flag as well? Yes, several things. <clears throat> I was in Scotland last week. Scotland has offshore wind capacity, wind, mm. three times their requirement, three times the requirement. So it's not the supply issue, it's a distribution issue. Mm. The hybrid, the distribution system, Iberdola, own Scottish power. Scottish power runs a Whiteley wind farm in near Glasgow. Now I visited the wind farm, by the way. So this is the issue. Issue is not, isn't it? It's very complex, interdependent issue. Take mm. layer by layer. Let's, let's uh, peel it through. First is electrification. What does it mean? Again, case in point. I was in Honolulu, Hawaii, a couple of years back. And Hawaii, because of the state incentive, mm -hmm. on top of the federal incentive, you can put solar panels, rooftop, and get paid for in less than a year, done. The problem is you need power at night. Then you hook up to the power grid to get power at night. This electrification issue. And power company charges a lot of money to give you that little power at night. So they figured out they can buy batteries mm. and charge the battery during daytime, the demand is low, use at night. So they can be totally off grid. The, the, I call it distributed electrification, the different kinds of electrification, bulk power and distribute. Mm -hmm. Honolulu is a good example of distributed electrification, independent. Mm -hmm. Now the question that Catherine raised, where do you charge your car? So if you have, buy the big enough battery or share the battery among your neighbors, you can charge the car. So we keep our thinking very broad. We cannot stay in the box we have been in the last 120 years and solve the problem. So something called transactive energy. You mm. transact energy between neighbors. That's happening in some parts of the world. I did some research myself, but there's some regulations to prohibit that today in the US market. So it is policy issues, think out of the box, let the people at the local level find opportunities to electrify as mm. well as share resources. So my theme is share, innovate, and 
keep the options open. Like Hawaii, option is buy batteries, battery wall. Then mm -hmm. this kind of power grid. So that's another way of thinking about the challenge. Our truck charging was in Shanghai three weeks ago. They have built 350 kilowatt motors for trucks. And those are now charged in the tracking, tracking centers that requires bulk supply to these areas. It's happening. So mm. what we can do here, Ursula and this group, we can make these case studies known to the global audience. Mm. So what can India do, for example, that learn from Chinese experience? What can US do learning from EU experience and vice versa? In the US, a lot of money now in the, uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, to build charging stations. That's happening. Mm -hmm. So bring that idea to the, to the attention of policymakers, newspaper people like Financial Times, Economist and the like, and the local mm -hmm. level uh, policymakers. That would be my big picture approach. Thanks, Saifir. And in fact, I just wanted to follow up because, you know, um, Michele Lariola from Essence, I hope I've pronounced this correctly, um, has a question about the infrastructure. So one of them is cabling, right? So what he's talking about is at what point do we decentralize production? So one aspect is the sharing, as you talked about, the technology in, in uh, innovation. Um, but should we be producing new points of production and changing the system? How do we change the system overall? Should we be decentralizing and so forth? And then afterwards, I'll go to Francisco to respond since you already mentioned his companies particularly. And I, and I think Katerina has a, a question. But Saifun, if you have a, a response to Michele, and then I could yes, go. Yes, to I just read his question, uh, Michele's question. My point is we have to think locally and act globally. Think locally, what can you do in your neighborhood? Can you share your supply with your neighbors? It's possible today. Uh, can you build a battery big enough to charge your car as well? Or share with your neighbors? There's a project in, I think, uh, Alabama uh, yeah, in the US, where they have built homes close to each other. They share the resources. So answer to this question is, do not think about bringing power long distances. Always, it will happen. Mm -hmm. But what sources you can use to make it a go? Second, very important, we forget this part. Energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. Can you do less? When you are not home, raise the temperature at 26, 27, air conditioning, summertime, not 22 centigrade. Mm -hmm. You reduce the demand by 30%. So if you reduce the demand, Mm -hmm. You don't need to bring as much power to meet that demand. So that my first answer is energy efficiency, mm -hmm. demand reduction, and demand distribution among neighbors. It's a new way of thinking, but that's how we have to go forward making this issue of large cables uh, being uh, being uh, a detriment. Thank you, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Francesca, let me let me bring you in a minute because uh, I know this probably is very interesting for you. And then Katerina, I'll come to you after. But yeah, go ahead, Francisco. Yes. So I think it's a very interesting question. I mean, we 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 think. I mean, we we have to think that we are probably in the biggest change that we 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 all have had uh, as a global economy since I don't know how many centuries ago. So uh, uh, changes are going to be very profound. So. I mean, the, the system is already changing. I mean, uh, 20 years ago, uh, the electricity system was based in a very large uh, electricity electricity plants, um, producing a lot of energy in, in very specific places. And, and now this is changing. In, in, in Spain, for example, we have around 30% of our electricity coming from distributed generation. This is renewables. I mean, uh, I mean, um, uh, wind energy and, and PV. And this is, I mean, the, the the dynamics of the system and how to manage the system is 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 changing completely. And we, I mean, the the challenge is so big that we need all efforts. So. Uh, uh, self production and 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 batteries behind the meter are very welcome um usually 
large facilities, I mean, large PV or wind facilities have some advantages of economies of scale, but um, there are many incentives also for for uh, self-consumption, and, and this is this is good, and things are changing. But we we don't have to to forget that the the electricity system is a very big machine, probably the largest machine in the world. And the networks are essential to optimize everything because we, we don't have to think uh, of the uh, networks uh, as, as a way to move electricity, that this is true, but this is a way to connect everything so the system is uh, uh, overall uh, optimized. And, and I think this is very important. Um, when, when you see the, the, the long-term scenarios uh, for every dollar that you need to invest on renewables, you need to invest another dollar on, on grids. And, and this is really um, something that people are not aware. So renewables are very important. Uh, uh, networks are key and, and, also, and are, are also very important. The, ch the system is changing uh, from a centralized elect uh, uh, from a centralized system to a more distributed system. But the best way to optimize everything is is through through connecting everything through the through the networks. I mean, we can talk about the challenges, but this is our, this is my my view. Thanks, and I know Katerina, you also had a comment. So so please, you know, uh, go ahead with that. I'm trying to tie it. It's a while ago, but I'll try to tie it in to what uh, Francisco is saying. I think the connectivity and creating a network is really key. And it can include also the parts that where you produce the electricity mm -hmm. yourself, like Cypher mentioned, um, and the sharing. And I like the part about thinking out of the box um, in terms of it's not only my demand and my supply, but it's more really an orchestration of when do we have a supply where and when do we have a demand. But, and, and I like that for the private sector, mm -hmm. I think this is really great also connecting with neighbors. Mm -hmm. I just also wanted to make the point that if we want to solve the big chunk in the industry, um, this will not be the only way it will it, that helps. So if I, for example, look at our warehouses where we can charge our um, trucks or vehicles, um, even if we put the whole roof with solar, we don't have enough power to fuel our not even a truck so we don't even most of the times have enough solar to power our operations within the facility so then to think that we would have more capacity to to um, charge more than that i just want to point it out that we shouldn't have an illusion that that we just i'm not saying that anyone said it but i think sometimes we're like oh we just put solar on the roofs where we have industry, they will charge their own vehicles and then, then that part is solved and we don't, maybe we don't need to talk about the grid and, and how we feed in renewables into there. And I just wanna be very clear that we cannot rely only on that um, mm -hmm. because even if we have batteries, which of course we need in order to make use of all the electricity mm -hmm. we can generate, um, it will not help us um, to, to have the capacity. It will help us, but it won't solve the infrastructure topic. For sure. Yeah, no, and clearly in this debate, you know, in order to, to do everything, as people have mentioned, we need all the solutions, right? So we need massive electrification, yeah. but we also need energy efficiency, we need to look at demand questions, and the broader infrastructure. And um, just maybe and one more point that I really liked about what Saifo said is, of course, and it's almost a disclaimer before you go into any discussion mm -hmm. is if we talk about renewables and electrification, we're talking burn clean. But of course, before that should always be burn less. So all the efficiency measures should not be forgot forgotten because the less demand we have, the less supply we need to generate. So I think sometimes that, that gets a bit forgotten in the convenience Mm -hmm. kind of way because it's more convenient if you just replace um the electricity or the diesel for electricity and makes you feel good you don't have to change that much but i think we really also need that aspect thank you i mean i just maybe take it a little bit to the policy side we don't have tom so let's uh but you know let's open up that aspect of the discussion 
I mean, some of you might have seen the, the Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson, recently published a blog in the FT saying there's no green future for Europe without an upgraded power grid. And I've also seen that in the, the Q&A, um, uh, Duncan has mentioned that technology is the easy part, in fact. Um, government's policy and societal op opposition is the major issue. So basically, how do we, you know, what policies do we need, in fact, to help deal with these issues that we've been talking about? How can we uh, deal with the different elements of this? I don't know who'd like to go first, uh, Francisco or, or Cypher? Francisco, go ahead. Yeah. And then maybe Cypher after yes. that. Yes, I'm, I'm going to talk about the electricity in general. I mean, for networks is more specific, but uh, I, I will talk in general. I mean, I, I think that the first challenge as you said, is a social acceptance. I mean, people must be aware that we need renewables because when when you want to install renewables on networks, um, local people have to accept that in the sense that they are going to be living with that. And, and, and you need this local uh, social... Um, uh, 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 authorization from 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 locals because uh, if people um, uh, living in the country or wherever don't accept renewables or networks, we are not going to 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 meet the target. So this is one of the the main questions. The second second question probably is permitting. I mean, this sounds bureaucratic, but this is probably the 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 main challenge that we have now in the electricity sector. I mean, to build a, a power plant, a, a PV plant, maybe it, it can take one year, less than a year, but to have all the permits, you can be there asking for, you know, going to the diff different administration, you, you can be there for, I don't know, two, five years, and for networks, you can, uh, it, it can take 10 to, to 15 years in some cases, and, and this is terrible. Because we, we have to think that we have to, we should be carbon neutral in 2050, so we have to run a lot. Um, for attracting, you need also uh, frameworks to to attract investments. I mean, you need a a, a proper uh, a power market design. Um, you need also, I think, um, uh, you have to think in advance. I mean, you cannot wait for I don't know uh, some uh, a logistic operator to ask for. Uh, grid access. You have to be thinking uh, in advance what are going to be the needs because, in a, a, you know, um, a, a, a capacity increase um, can take I don't know five years to do it. So you have to you, you cannot wait for people to ask for that, and and regulators have to change their mind because now we are very used to approve everything that we need, but now we have to think okay, what would what will we need in in five years from now, and and we have to 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 plan and and to think in advance. Um, um, also, uh, supply chains are going to be or are also uh, are uh, um, currently an issue. I mean, we have to triple the investment that we are doing in the electricity system. This is true for renewables, and this is true also for for networks, and we have to scale up all the uh, supply chains. I mean, I'm talking about manufacturing capacities, but also uh, 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 minerals and, and everything. And this is this is, this is is uh, very important. Thank you so much, Francisco. Saifu, where, where, where do you land on these questions? Yes, yes. Uh, three things. Francisco, talk about what we should do. I focus on what we can do and how. Should is a big picture. If you don't put the how part, then should remain should forever. <laughs> so the question is two examples. Germany, the offshore wind is in the northern part of the country, demand in the southern part. They want to build transmission corridor, bring power from north to south. Mm. Huge public opposition in Germany. They don't like it. So they are going to go underground. Cost more money, but that's how you solve it. Mm -hmm. Second example, Virginia. We have strong offshore wind capability, Virginia go, going towards uh, Atlantic. But point is a lot of nice beaches there. Public would not tolerate mm -hmm. wind turbines damaging their view. They would not tolerate that. What we did, 
we went 40 kilometers out, 40 kilometers out. So it's beyond the horizon. You cannot see it anymore, even with the binoculars. That's what we're doing today. We're building wind turbines 40 kilometers away from the shore, beyond your visual sight. As an example, it costs more money, but money should not be your only driver. Money is a is a is a is a uh, element in your decision, but if you cannot get your neighbor to accept what you do, nothing will be done. Mm -mm. Like Francisco said, it takes sometimes 10 years to get transmission land corridor approval done. That's that's the challenge. So we have to educate our policymakers, our neighbors, our citizens, why it is important to have clean power to fight climate change. People get it. They get that part, climate change. Mm -hmm. But clearly, there is a distrust in the public for electric utilities, distrust, because of the history. Mm -hmm. So that has to be broken. There are people like you and us who are not, or not only building power stations, trying to solve the problem, can be, can be advocates. Mm -hmm. And they're very important uh, for you, Ursula. You also, um, also uh, newspaper people, right? Advocates mm. of what needs to be done and why. People are not dumb; they they get it, but they have a fixed idea because of history, and that is a big challenge we have to overcome. Mm. I'm, a, I'm an educator; I get that. So I want to talk to my students. Over time, they change their minds. Mm. But I would suggest news agencies, universities. Utilities, DHL, <laughs> educate your customers why we do this. So my and focus is, I will not tell you what we need to do. I will tell you also why we need to do this. Mm. Then I think get the message across. I I fully uh, sorry. Go I'll go, try please. to keep short and <laughs> hand go, over. Go, please. <laughs> <laughs> I fully agree on the educative part, and it's it's actually I think adding something from climate change and all of this just being difficult and something that is um, yeah you don't really know what 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 is right to do and you do this and then someone tells you oh but this is not the right thing to do um, to really say okay this is why we need to change something and what mm -hmm. we could do. Um, we at DHL, we have we start internally, so we have a train education program. It's certified Go Green specialist, so everyone get can get a certification on being a environmental specialist because our program is called Go Green, and that is also to educate then our customers who need the education. Some are already pretty educated, but think about we as DHL, we have around six hundred thousand employees. If each of them is educated and can then spread it, um, that will really make a difference. So I really agree on that. And you can spread it privately, but also with customers. So I agree mm -hmm. that, that that should really be a key. Ursula, Excellent. one thing I mean yeah, about this, ahead, because I think this is a very important point. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I mean, create awareness is very important and we are working on that, but also uh, electric utilities uh, have to do things better than in the past. Mm. And this is something that Shaifu said, and I think uh, I agree. I mean, we are aware in Iberdrola of that. Um, we have launched an internal program. It's called Convive. Convive means something mm -hmm. like living together. And it's about engaging with local communities, how local communities have, I, I mean, can uh, benefit from this type of investments, and um, mm -hmm. how to develop, for example, a local yeah. industry and jobs. Also very important, what is the impact of uh, these investments on nature? So we have a, a, a target mm -hmm. to be a nature positive in 2030. And every uh, investment that we do now, I mean, we analyze very, very deeply how uh, these uh, impacts on nature, how we can do it better to increase bio biodiversity. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's, it's create, it, Creating awareness is important, but also do doing things in the right way or in a better way is also key. Mm -mm. Absolutely, and I, I think there's some also really interesting projects um, I've, I've I've seen for 
about community acceptance of or engagement. So what can, what benefits can communities really see from electricity or uh, electrification projects or renewable farms? Uh, I think Finland, for example, does a tax scheme or something similar that flows directly into the local community. So I think there's some really interesting points like that. I think on the policy aspect more broadly, I mean, in the EU, I think I agree with Cypher, it's not just how or, you know, what we should be doing, but how and why we're doing it. But I, I do think there is a, a key ask from a lot of businesses that we talk to, which is how do we have the long term perspective? How do we see where we need to go? And therefore, how do we kind of line up all the different elements that will, will bring us there? So in the EU, we have the Green Deal. We have the goals for 2050, um, 2030 and soon for, for 2040. We have a massive package of legislation looking at renewables, energy efficiency and so forth. Um, but of course, there are still questions around investment. How do we really ramp up the investment needed? Um, and I think it was interesting, Saifa, you were mentioning we shouldn't just be talking about money, but actually this is one of the questions. How do we bring in the scale of investment needed in the next period? I think there's a question in the chat also uh, from Alex West saying, um, is, the, is the current economic climate um, going to impact the the sustain the investments companies are making. I think the same would go for governments in terms of scaling up uh, investment. However, I also know that there are you know there's a real interest. Um, there's some big projects in the US, obviously with the Inflation Reduction Act. There's some big investments in Europe and beyond. So, I mean, Cipher, how do you see the investment aspect? In fact, you know, what do we need to really drive the investment beyond right. having this policy? perspective, this long-term policy perspective. Talk about bulk power. Yeah. Three components, generation, mm. transmission, local distribution, three components. Yeah. Generation is the money, power station, energy, cell, make money. Transmission, mm. no money. It's a highway, it's a tax. So power companies build it because they have to build it. Mm. So in the U.S., some talk is going on to invest money in building corridors, transmission corridors. Mm. It's typically government's job, transmission corridors. But this, if you talk about investment, we have to change our thinking. Why should Iberdola invest in Glasgow to build a transmission corridor? Because they can sell more wind energy. That connection has to be made. So coming back to your question, Ursula, about investment and money, we have to provide incentives mm. for investment. They have to know where's my return. So return is clear for the power station, not clear for distribution. If you look about talk about bulk power supply. So I would like to suggest here that make some policy so that as you carry power through point A mm. to point B, that highway has a toll. It is a toll. <laughs> And they invest, why, good point, good point. Why people invest money to build toll roads? In mm. Virginia, Australia came in to build a toll road for Virginia, Australian company, because they collect money from tolls. Mm. So same thinking, can you find a way to add revenue to investors so they build a transmission corridor, which is a money-making machine for them? Mm. It's happening in the uh, highway sector. Why not power sector, as an example? Mm -hmm. And finally, before I, I leave, transmission corridors are from supply to the user. They could be 200 kilometers away. People along the way do not benefit from it. They don't they just see it, don't benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Good example, Brazil, a lot of long distance lines, public opposition, because we don't get anything, get anything out of it. So because power company says the demand is so low in these villages, it is mm -hmm. not possible for us, power company, to build a distribution system to give power to these people. Not enough demand. They don't build it. Now there is technology available now through magnetic field induction to give power to local villages along the way at a very low cost. Mm. Thus, again, technology can be pushed forward to be creative in making local citizens feel some ownership in this project, then they would mm. not object as much. Thank you. And uh, Katerina and Francisco, how do you see the incentives part of it? You know, what do you, what sort of investment 
um, incentives or, or how do you see this question? Well, I mean, um, we're, we're. I think it's a. Uh, if we work hand in hand, it, that's how it works well, as as usual. So, DHL is not shy to invest. We have come out and said, well, in order to achieve our targets by twenty thirty, we want to invest seven billion euro um, in this. So, I think there is capital that we want to bring to the table, and are not mm. just asking everyone around us to solve it. And we're the users, we do want to be um, leading the way and also being part of the solution early and helping to really in this difficult part now. Um, but of course, if I look at where do we deploy electric vehicles, there's a very different landscapes in terms of subsidies, mm. now taking it away from the whole grid discussion that we just had. And it's the same for private mm. as for for um, the industry. If, if there's a subsidy, to do it, then of course that's an incentive and that's how it then can go hand in hand. It's an incentive for us to invest in it. It's an incentive for customers to mm. say, well, actually DHL, we're fine if you do this, because in the end you have to see, we also need to have our customers on board uh, for them to say, yeah, okay, we will choose you. It, um, and we're, we're in this together with you because uh, we can carry it for a little bit our, our, um, on our own, but at some point we need mm. customers in there. So ideally, in my ideal world, you have the um, governments or the legislation that supports, takes a share. Ideally, that's the infrastructure part because that's we can't we can least influence or solve ourselves. But also, of course, helps us in terms of if there's targets or Cypher mentioned mm. at all. Um, we do have legislation where it's really beneficial um, mm -hmm. for technologies and others where it's maybe not so beneficial in other countries. And we do mm. see, of course, that that really speeds up the way the, the, the volumes. I think that that's very clear. So if we can get that in place, I think everyone even if I have to sell it to a customer and I can say, look, we pay something in this. Mm. The majority, the society, the government, you name it, like play, pays a part of this and you pay part of this. And it really feels truly we're doing this together. Indeed. And I think that there's this part as well, which I think is quite interesting, which is when when we've done some analysis of the impact, say, so say, for example, a government really funds uh the the transition uh to electric vehicles or it really funds uh, uh renewables and so forth it is actually some of the best investments the government can do in terms of maximizing benefits across the economy both in terms of jobs but also broader G uh, yeah. gdp questions and so on um not to mention of course removing some externalities such as improving air quality and so forth so I think there's a lot of evidence out there that investing, like investing in this for a government perspective, it, it have, brings enormous benefits. Um, but obviously, you need to to do it uh, to set it up in such a way that you can uh, roll together the public and private investments and and bring in citizens where interesting. I don't know, Francisco, if you have a yeah. a comment on this actually. Yeah, a couple mm -hmm. of comments. I mean, we we mm -hmm. haven't we haven't talked too much about why we are electrifying and we, yeah. why why should we be, we will be in the, uh, we, why should be why we should be, be electrify, electrifying but one of the things is that uh, renewables have become the cheapest way of producing electricity in 80% mm -hmm. of the of the countries and mm -hmm. this is very important so uh, the the more you develop renewables the lower price for mm -hmm. electricity you have and this is true every almost everywhere i mean this is true in europe in the um, in the us is, is not exactly this but mm -hmm. in 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 asia in most cases this, this is this is the case and 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 this is a very important thing i mean a, a investing in renewables means lower price electricity price in the future but as i said it's not about just building renewables and electricity system mm -hmm. is how to decarbonize all uses of uh, uh, today's energy uh, system. And so s since uh, a couple of years ago, we started also to uh, engage with our customers. I mean, uh, industrial customers and, mm -hmm. and also uh, domestic customers, but especially in industries 
to see how they can uh, electrify their uses, uh, mm. having a, um, a, a clean uh, energy supply, but also a lower uh, bill uh, mm. month after month. And in many cases, uh, electrification is, is uh, the, the most economic option uh, for them. And and we are working with uh, with them. We are um, developing new new services. I mean, it's not just electric mm. vehicles. That because I mean, I think that uh, electric vehicles is a very clear um, uh, sector where um, electricity is is going to be in the money. Is is almost now in and and, and in, in many cases is 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 today is in the money, but in in two three four years is going to be clear mm. clearly in the money because electric vehicles are going to be cheaper than uh, uh, internal combustion engines. But also it's about uh, heat pumps for uh, buildings, heat pumps for mm. industries, and also higher temperature processes. And now we are developing, for example, I mean uh, use PV to produce very cheap electricity. And, mm. and you use this electricity to produce heat and you storage this heat. So you can mm. uh, supply a constant uh, uh, su uh, heat supply to industrial customers. So new uh, solutions are, are coming and, and I think that uh, things are getting easier uh, uh, year after year. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I was just thinking about this. It's really true. We have to think about this across different sectors as well, and different sectors have different challenges. So, of course, in the industry sector, many industries, if they are to decarbonize, have to electrify very heat intensive uh, furnaces and so forth. In buildings, you have the question about, yeah, as you say, heat pumps, solar panels and, and other things. Um, in transport, there's the electrification of the um, of, of the transport, uh, the mobility system, and then of course the power grids is is a, is kind of the part of the distribution of all of that. So there are a number of different challenges, but I think one point that perhaps we should bring out a little bit is you know one thing is talking about this in say in um, you know the more um, developed worlds. Um, other things in more poorer countries they have different challenges as well. I I don't know Cypher if you'd like to talk to to that question. How do we really, um, what kinds of projects are there in perhaps more rural countries and how do we really direct investment um, to, the, to the global south? Very good point, Ursula. A couple of cases here, like South Africa, for example, mm. severe power shortage today, severe shortage, because not enough network capacity. And the question that was brought early, earlier, that network is important to optimize, mm. but if the demand is not, enough in the far away areas cannot optimize because their demand is so low, you cannot return the investment that you've mm. made to build the line to that village. It doesn't make sense. So that is a local solution. The things called microgrid, make a village an mm. entity, not part of the network, entity. And they can share resources using battery and as I said already, energy efficiency. You can do less use less electricity to do the same thing. So mm. my answer to your question directly is, think for local solutions. Mm. Have to be power grid all over the world, local solutions. And they need some investments to get going. Mm. So I triple you have done that work in Nigeria and Uganda. Mm. We give money for the villagers to buy solar panels. And they have a small, they have built a clinic for COVID testing in Nigeria. Mm using uh, our uh, resources. Now that is spreading because they know it's not that expensive as Francisco said, but they don't know what to do, how to do this. Mm. So I took this perspective, we have some examples that can be scaled in many parts of the world so that we have to put the seed. You can do this, UK can do this, DHL can do this, and CSR. The CSR, DHL could be someplace in Africa where they put it put money to show a village how to be self-sufficient for meeting basic needs, not air conditioning, light, some mm. uh, mobile phone charging places, things of that type. So my solution is don't solve the problem on one, one go, solve mm. in pockets, give examples and scale it. Then people will say, well, this was done somewhere, I can do it too. 
If I go to a village, first question they ask, can you tell me where it has been done? Where it has been done? First question, you show them pictures, they get excited. Then they go, okay, I can do it too. So that's the scaling up I would like to propose. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I agree as well. There is a question about capacity transfer as much as investment transfer uh, between, for example, the EU and, and the Global South. But I think we're, we're heading towards the end of this webinar now. And I, it's been a really fascinating discussion. So, so thank you, everybody. But perhaps if I can ask you for just, you know, your kind of key two, maximum three takeaways uh, from the discussion. And perhaps I um, start with Katerina and then head to Francisco and finish off with Saifa. What would be your, your key takeaways from this discussion, Katerina? What do we need to do to, to drive this promise of uh, electrification? Oh, you're on mute, Katerina. <laughs> uh, I just answered a question in the chat, so I muted myself. <laughs> I felt bad we didn't answer all the questions, so I started answering them and typing. Um, so I would say number one is um, that we, once we have all accepted that for electrification and that electrification A is the future, um, the near future, then we should also work together on, on it. And mm -hmm. that means um, trying really to channel more towards that being in education parts or in the request to policy or in talking to our customers, to our neighbors, <laughs> to some other point. So I think if, if we can channel it more, that would help and then get everyone behind this. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's the first one. The second one is um, that it's a little, little bit related, but really need, we really need um, big commitments and investments mm -hmm. in that. And it has to come both from ourselves as a private person, as an industry, wh wherever you are, actually, we all need to contribute to it. And it can't be something that is number 10 or 20 or somewhere in your mm -hmm. investments or in your commitments. It really needs to be in the top three or five. So I think we really need to bring it very high up. That would be um, the second takeaway. And the third one is that, um, yeah, it's it's still... It's still a lot to be solved because the demand will be huge if everything yeah. comes true. So probably we need an orchestration of all of the different things, yeah. but also the demand and the supply. Yeah. So we maybe need to invest more in the intelligence. How do we, do we? Where do we all get it from? How do we distribute mm -hmm. it for whom needs it at what point in time? Um, just, yeah. so that everyone can contribute and we really harvest all the fruits that are out there and not just the two or three big ones. Thank you so much. And Francisco, quickly, your, your takeaways. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that we all should be aware that electrification is good. I mean, this is going to be good for uh, electricity cost, it's going to be good for electricity security, and it's, and it's going to be good for um uh, uh, the sustainability of the of the uh, of the energy system I'm, I'm talking about climate change i'm talking about pollution and everything so we have to multiply the electricity system by three to five times what we have today and this is a great challenge so what and and and, and something similar to katarina i mean this is a huge challenge and, and we have to work all together and we we, we call for alliances, alliances with the mm -hmm. different administrations, alliances with, with companies, with consumers, and also with citizens, with citizens. So this is a work for all, and, and we have to work all together with the same target. Thank you so much. So all together. And Saifi, you're, you're closing your remarks. Very, very quickly, very quickly. My takeaway is we have to have a sense of ownership of this challenge. Mm. I mean, everybody, village to the president, ownership. I go to the village, they get it. They say, give me the tool so I can be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Solar panel in a village in Nigeria, they feel good. Then the question is, where's the money coming from? This is all at the bottom line, money coming from. Mm -hmm. I think corporations, governments have a responsibility to fight climate change and they get it. But they need, a, they need a highway tool mm -hmm. to process their money to reach that village in Uganda or Nigeria. 
So that's where you and I and everybody else can play a role mm -hmm. with the path from the supplier to the receiver and receiver's gratitude following back to the supplier that their money came to good use. So that's my roadmap. Thank you so much. At this point, I, I have to hand to Alexia, I think, to, to, to shut the, the webinar. But uh, thank you, everybody, for all your comments. I tried to get to as many questions as possible, but it's a, it's a huge topic and uh, worth a lot more examination. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, uh, just to echo, uh, echo that. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate this, this whole hour. It's been so enlightening. And I appreciate your candor and your honesty about um, the next steps that are, are really key for for this journey. So, um, yeah, there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm I'm really looking forward um, to, to to hearing more from you and 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 keeping in touch and um, yeah, working out um, what are the next steps in the future. But um, I want to just confirm that this webinar will be on demand. Demand, um, and if you'd like to watch it again so, or share it with your peers, um, it will be uh, the link will be with you in the next 24 hours. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is part of our series in collaboration with IEEE on the green tech revolution. And the next episode in this series uh, is on the impact of um, the frontier technologies on climate. So uh, that will be hosted on the 11th of October. So please save the date. More information will be coming to you shortly on that and check out the ITCC website in the meantime for more. But um, we are also pleased to stay, stay for a couple, couple more seconds after the webinar ends for a short survey to share your views on the limits and challenges of electrification. It'll be really useful for our analysis and research and we'll be able to session more details about that. But once again, I just wanna say, Thank you for listening. Thank you for your questions. And thank you again for our incredible panelists and moderator. I really appreciate your time. And um, so that's all from us today. Hope you have a great afternoon and uh, see you soon. All the best. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>